As we welcome you once again to Christchurch Cathedral in the Falkland Islands, we're holding our breath as the clock ticks down to Christmas Eve and that momentous birth in the stable at Bethlehem. Or was it a cave? Or maybe even a guest room in the house of one of Joseph's relations? Because the Bible wasn't written in English, we can't be absolutely certain, because the word used in Greek could mean any of those. But of course, why spoil a good story as we welcome the Christ child into our world? Those of you who were listening last week may remember that I mentioned the high temperatures and lack of rain. I've been given strict instructions not to mention any of this again because no sooner had the words left my lips than the rain and the sleet and the snow began and it has hardly stopped since. The cathedral roof has been echoing to the sound of rain. So let me just wish you all, wherever you are, a very happy Christmas and weather appropriate to your season. And as we think or begin to think about those Christmas celebrations, I should perhaps mention that we will have a very special guest here on Christmas night together with the Holy Family. Our guest might be here in person, but even if he isn't, he will still be looking down on us. Well, who am I referring to? Well, it couldn't be anyone other than Father Christmas or Santa Claus, could it? Well, actually, he was a real person, and we know him here rather better as St Nicholas, particularly as he looks down on us from our great east window. As the Governor has already granted Santa Claus the necessary permits to enter the Falklands as a key worker, as well as exemption from the quarantine regulations subject to certain conditions, firstly that he wears a face mask at all times, except when eating the mince pies and drinking the sherry that has been left out for him by all the girls and boys, and that Rudolph's red nose will be swabbed and Mr. Claus and all his reindeer will be tested to ensure that they are coho hovid free the cathedral is encouraging him to call in during his Falklands itinerary. And in order to facilitate this, as rector for the time being, therefore, and in pursuance of section 9 of the Constitution of Christchurch Cathedral, as approved by the registered vestry on the 1st of October 1978, I am issuing St Nicholas with a permit to use the cathedral's landing strip, which is conveniently wide enough for a sleigh with a competent driver. This landing strip is more particularly described as the roadway between the Cathedral and John Street under the authority of a special grant number 303 by Victoria, by the grace of God of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland Queen, Defender of the Faith, etc., given under letters patent dated the 28th of February 1887. This will, of course, enable St Nicholas to make a brief stop for carols under the Whalebone Arch and Midnight Mass, wearing his face mask, of course, while the relevant testing is undertaken before his onward journey. So, wherever you are watching, we hope that you enjoy our service today and will want to join us again on Christmas Day as we celebrate the birth of the baby Jesus. Happy Christmas. St Nicholas does not of course appear in the cathedral's great east window because of his connection with Christmas. He is one of two saints associated with the first Bishop of the Falkland Islands, Waite Hawkins Stirling. They are on the left St Peter holding the keys to heaven and on the right St Nicholas holding the Bishop's Yawl, the messenger. Having said that there is no direct connection between the window and Christmas, Stirling was actually consecrated only four days before Christmas 1869 and Nicholas of course has been associated with gift giving 
and the Christmas season since very early times. So who was the historical St Nicholas? He was born in about 280 AD to a wealthy Greek family in Patras, a port on the Mediterranean coast where he later became bishop. Over the course of time he became famous for his kindness and generosity to the poor, being specifically credited with saving three boys from being butchered, rescuing a boatload of pilgrims, providing secret dowries of gold for three daughters of an impoverished nobleman, and saving the city of Myra from starvation. It was as a result of stories like this that Nicholas was rapidly made the patron saint of sailors, children, merchants, pawnbrokers and the poor. He died on the 6th of December 343 and his shrine soon became one of the most popular places of pilgrimage anywhere in the world. The stories suggest that he was indeed a model Christian and a very suitable candidate for reincarnation as the Christmas Santa Claus, itself a corruption of the name Nicholas. In the cathedral's east window he appears in his traditional colour of green. In the days before Coca-Cola turned him into an advertising slogan as the plump jolly man dressed in red that we recognise today as Father Christmas. Bishop Stirling died in 1924 and by December of that year a stained glass window at the east end of the cathedral was already under consideration. Governor of the day Sir John Middleton took a keen interest in the proposal and wrote to potential donors worldwide soliciting subscriptions. It appears, however, that the bishop was not initially supportive. As Dean Smith in one of his letters writes, we, on the other hand, were determined to have something here and, as it appeared that we should have to provide the money entirely ourselves, we felt we could not undertake anything that would involve a large expenditure. Luckily now, that has all changed, and you and your diocese have done us a great service by promising to contribute and by insisting that the memorial shall be in our cathedral. Dean Smith seems to have been lukewarm over the window, however, preferring a new oak chancel screen, which he described as the most appropriate memorial. While saying that a stained glass window could be put in in the course of time, he hopes that someone other than myself will be responsible. I am woefully ignorant about stained glass windows, he wrote, even though I have very decided likes and dislikes in this connection, adding that I should hate to live and worship with an east window that annoyed me. Can we perhaps hear in this a reluctance to approve a window with saints and the central figure of Christ the King. In the event, the design was formally put to the Cathedral Council on the 28th of January 1926, when the minutes record that the chairman produced a design of the proposed stained glass window to be placed in the cathedral to the memory of the late Bishop Stirling. The design had been furnished by Mr A.K. Nicholson of 105 Gower Street, London, WC1, who described the same in detail. The cost of the window is estimated at £300, carriage by sea and insurance extra. Discussion continued until 1926, probably because of the difficult fundraising situation. By the 18th of March, however, over £781 had been raised. At a meeting of the Church Council on that day, Drawings of the proposed memorial window were examined and various points in connection with it discussed, among them being the place for the title or inscription, the blocking of the view caused by the reredos and screen, and the colours of the coat of arms at the bottom of the window. Nevertheless, the window was finally approved, and the next we hear is not only that the work on the window has been completed, but the window itself is expected by the June mailboat, £600 already having been sent to England on account. 
The east window, complete with St Nicholas, was erected fairly soon after this in 1927 and in December a description appeared in the Falkland Islands magazine and church paper written by Archibald Nicholson, the artist and designer. In the right light we have the figure of St Nicholas, he wrote, the patron of all those who go down to the sea in ships and occupy their business in great waters. He wears full episcopal vestments and holds in his left arm the model of the small yawl called the Messenger in which the bishop used to tour around his diocese. I believe it was a boat of some ten or twelve tons and made some wonderful voyages between the islands and the mainland. The window which Bishop Ivory had said would appeal to most South American donors as being usual, visible and concrete remains to this day a fitting memorial to Bishop Stirling and a visual human connection with the Christmas story through the generosity and gift-giving of St Nicholas. We start the programme today with one of the best-known Christmas carols, O Come All Ye Faithful. Although there is a gap of well over a thousand years between St Nicholas and its author, possibly John Wade in the 18th century, John Redding a hundred years earlier, or even King John IV of Portugal, the thoughts expressed are ones that would have been thoroughly approved of by him. Not only are we encouraged to come heart and mind to the stable in Bethlehem, but to sing with the angels, worship with the shepherds, and above all to recognise that this is not just a baby, but true God of true God, and light from light eternal. No wonder, then, that the chorus compels us to come and adore him, Christ the Lord. As usual, the words are on the screen, so do please join in this classic with us at home.
even where we cannot gather in person. Emmanuel, Emmanuel God, God with, with us. us. Even where some Christmas traditions may have to go. Emmanuel, Emmanuel God, God with, with us. Even where we might not get to hug family and friends. Emmanuel, Emmanuel God, God with, with us. Even where we cannot sing carols beside each other. Emmanuel, Emmanuel God, God with us. us. Even if Christmas cheer is harder this year. Emmanuel, God with us. Dreams and angels, prophecies, mystery and magi, choirs and shepherds, we make our way to the star-blessed stable, to the light shining miraculously in human misery and darkness. We are almost there. Once God's plan was a mystery hidden from our sight. Now God has disclosed what was kept secret for so very long. He has brought it out in the light. In the brighter light on this fourth Sunday in Advent, may we see more clearly the glory of God in Christ and sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. With my mouth, I will proclaim your faithfulness to all generations. I declare that your steadfast love is established forever. Your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. And now we light the fourth of our Advent candles. Now four candles, see them glow brightly so that all may know how four candles show the way, making our darkness bright as God's day. I declare that your steadfast love is established forever. Your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. Dear, Dear God, God, your faithfulness has been great leading us to this day of anticipation and celebration. May the glorious light of your steadfast love shine brightly in us and through us, that all may give you praise and glory. In the Saviour's name we pray. Amen. Let us pray. God of eternity, mother of the cosmos, creation conceived in the father's womb, we pause and ponder the birth of space and time and the evolution of things seen and unseen. We wait for the joy and celebration of a greater birth, of a life surrendered to you. We pause and ponder the perspective our faith offers the place of prayer and selflessness in a culture of frantic busyness, in a world of emptiness and excess. Each day we balance love of neighbour and love of self. Each day we wrestle with moral complexities and compromises. Each day we need your love, compassion and forgiveness. Eternal lover, you know the burdens we carry, the pain, loneliness and fears. Bless us anew, restore and refresh us. May we stand before the forgiving Father and feel God's embrace. Divine Essence, grant us your strength as we journey through this sacred season. Be our companion as we make our way to the cave, to that place of birth, and death and rebirth. May we encounter eternity's secret and in simple silence hear the angels sing. Holy God, Father, Mother, Eternal Lover, we praise you for the magnificence of the cosmos, the complexities of our evolving universe, the beauty we find in the far-flung stars, the wonder in the tiniest creatures, and the tender transcendence of love, divine and human. In meditation, 
we gaze upon the face of Jesus, his eyes concealing the invisible God, and his soul seeping the still shalom of the sacred. We praise you, O God, for Jesus, his birth, teaching, healing, and selfless death. In him we are born anew, refreshed, restored, and raised to new life. It's not a big step from admiring the beauty of the far-flung stars to thinking about one particular star as it shone above the town of Bethlehem all those hundreds of years ago. O Little Town of Bethlehem was originally written by an American vicar, Phillips Brooks, for his Sunday school after a visit to the Holy Land in the mid-19th century. However, the carol so beautifully captures the moment of the Saviour's birth that it has become synonymous with the celebration of Christmas wherever English is spoken. You could almost say that Christmas would not be Christmas without the opportunity to sing For Christ is born of Mary, and gathered all above, while mortals sleep the angels keep their watch of wondering love. Stillness, the everlasting light, glad tidings, peace to men on earth, these are universal longings that build up the plea of the last line. O oh, come to us, abide with us, our Lord Emmanuel. The words are once again on the screen, so please do join in at home if you would like to. Little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Above thy deep and dreamless sleep, the silent stars go by. Yet in the dark street shineth the everlasting light. The and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. For Christ is born of Mary and gathered all above. While mortals sleep, the angels keep their watch of wandering love. Oh, Stars together proclaim the holy birth, and praises sing to God the King, and peace to men on earth. How silently, how silently, the wondrous gift is given, so God imparts to human the blessings of his hand. No year we hear his coming, but in this world of sin, where meek souls will receive him still, the dear Christ enters in. O holy child of Bethlehem, Descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in. Be born in us today. We hear the Christmas angels, the great glad tidings tell. Oh, come to us, abide with us, O oh Lord, be Our readings today tell us that God is the one who journeys with us, whose nature is steadfast love and faithfulness. Psalm 89 offers us that reassurance, so let it speak to your soul. In the reading from Samuel, 
King David is preoccupied with building a suitable house for God. However, it's clear that the Lord cannot be contained in any one fixed place and can't be defined by the work of human hands. God is always larger, more mysterious, more expansive than anything we can conceive or construct. And when we move on to Mary being visited by the Archangel Gabriel, commonly called the Annunciation, it's clear that something very special and miraculous is going on. Gabriel tells Mary that the Holy Spirit will overshadow her. It's not a word that we can ever fully understand, although the point surely is that God was the creator. In the face of Jesus, we see the invisible God. The nature of the eternal is revealed in time through the humanity of Jesus. Psalm 89, verses 1 to 4. I will sing of your steadfast love, O Lord, forever. With my mouth I will proclaim your faithfulness to all generations. I declare that your steadfast love is established forever. Your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. You said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to my servant David. I will establish your descendants forever and build your throne for all generations. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and shall be forever. Amen. The reading is taken from 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 1 to 11. <clears throat> now when the king was settled in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, the king said to the prophet Nathan, See now, I am living in a house of cedar, but the ark of God stays in a tent. Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. But the same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David. Thus says the Lord, Are you the one to build me a house to live in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day, but I have been moving about in a tent and a tabernacle. Wherever I have moved about among all the people of Israel, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribal leaders of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, to be prince over the people Israel, and I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you, and I will make you a great name of the great ones of the earth, and I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, so that they may live in their own place, and be disturbed no more, and evildoers shall afflict them no more as formerly from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. This is the word of the Lord. Perhaps in a sense, our next carol reflects the fact that God does not live in a house. This traditional Old English or perhaps more accurately Old Cornish Carol, emphasises the poverty of the shepherds, the cold winter's night, and the manger full of hay. In a line that we don't often sing these days, the wise men eventually found the babe in poverty. The carol probably dates from the early medieval period, and would have been widely sung across Britain. The modern version dates from the early 19th century, since when it has become popular across the whole English-speaking world. Although solidly based on the New Testament, the anonymous author has added some embellishments of his own. The words of this popular carol are on your screen, so 
please do join in at home if you would like to. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, favoured one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favour with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob for ever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. 
And now your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her, who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'm sure we've all been complaining about the weather this week. Heavy rain, storm force winds, sleet, snow. Will it be a white Christmas here in the middle of summer? Well, we shall just have to wait and see, but anything can happen. Weather is so very important to our everyday lives, isn't it? We like to think of it as a particularly British obsession, but we know from the TV news how devastating the effects of hurricanes, floods, tidal surges and heavy snow can be. And some of this goes back to biblical times. Matthew, for example, speaks of the Pharisees demanding a sign from Jesus. And he replies sarcastically, when evening comes, you say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, today it will be stormy, for the sky is red and overcast. Several times recently I found myself wondering what the weather was actually like for the home, Holy Family that very first Christmas. So it was something of an eye-opener a few years ago when I went to the Holy Land to find quite deep snow in Jerusalem, followed by heavy rain. Not what I had expected at all. It was supposed to be hot and sandy, not like the British weather we had hoped to avoid. It's a curious twist, isn't it? But I immediately felt closer to the events described in the Gospels. It was as if we had a real and tangible connection with the Holy Land. It actually snows and rains there, just like here. Now, of course, we can't be absolutely sure that Jesus was born on the 25th of December. There's nothing about the date of his birth in the Bible. We rely instead on a tradition started by the early church, maybe 200 or so years later rather like the Queen's official birthday. But it doesn't matter. This is the date on which we celebrate his birthday. And in this morning's Gospel, Luke concentrates on what we really need to hear. Firstly, Mary was a virgin, so this could not have been an ordinary human conception. Secondly, Jesus was the Son of God, born of the Holy Spirit. And thirdly, Mary said yes to this extraordinary request. She could have walked away, but she chose to obey God of her own free will. All three points are important for our understanding of Christmas. But Luke doesn't actually mention another important figure in the Christmas story, Joseph. But goodness knows he had good reason to leave Mary at this point. She had got herself pregnant and he is definitely not the father. Now we still see unmarried and unplanned teenage mothers today, but Matthew describes Joseph as a righteous man who is convinced by the angel in a dream that this is God's own child. Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. Far from being a bystander in the action, Joseph has an important part to play, and he says yes to God in much the same way that Mary had said yes earlier when asked by the angel to bear the saviour of the world. And we commemorate Mary's Annunciation in several different ways. Each time we say the Magnificat, for example. But poor old Joseph is often passed by. And in the interests of gender equality, perhaps it's time to rehabilitate him 
and acknowledge his special place in the Christmas story. Traditionally, we focus on Mary and her baby. But here, for a fleeting moment, let's think about the role of the man who was chosen to protect and help nurture Jesus during the formative years of his life. If Joseph had abandoned Mary at this point, the whole story could have been very different. None of this tells us anything about the weather, but even with shepherds out in the fields overnight, the clear skies in which the Christmas star could be seen suggest cold. And we know that the temperature in the region of Bethlehem ranges from an average 7 degrees centigrade to well below freezing at night and that there is frequent rain. So if only on a practical level Mary needed Joseph for support. It reminds me of the poem by T.S. Eliot about the wise men. A cold coming they had of it. It must have been equally difficult for Mary and Joseph on their long trek to Bethlehem. And as we come to the end of our Advent journey, it's time to join Mary and Joseph in the stable at the end of their journey. Whatever the weather outside, we are invited to come in and see the Christ child lying in the manger. It can indeed be a life-changing experience. As we share the good news of God's love, we now express our faith in the words of the Creed, and I invite you to join with me at home. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Collect for today, the fourth Sunday in Advent. God, our Redeemer, who prepared the Blessed Virgin Mary to be the mother of your Son, grant that, as she looked for his coming as our Saviour, so we may be ready to greet him when he comes again as our Judge, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. God of mercy, whose steadfast love and faithfulness have accompanied your people down the generations, we lift up before you those in need at this time. Bless our Queen and the governments throughout her dominions. In, In your, your mercy, mercy hear, hear our prayer. Grant wisdom and discernment to our leaders in the complex challenges which they face, balancing the demands of economics and health, physical and mental. May your spirit overshadow our health professionals, nurses, doctors, chaplains, and all who serve in our hospital and care for our frail and vulnerable and in the community. In, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Son of Mary, who sees the struggles and sufferings of mothers, their burdens of love, uphold those broken by life's demands through the support of prayer, family, friendship, and caring agencies. In our meditations, we are mindful of children without mothers, of people across the world who each day live without money, adequate education, drinking water, nourishing food, or the assurance of personal safety. 
in, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Son of Mary, like you, may we sit with those denied respect and dignity. Be present, O Christ, with those who are dying. Hold the hand of those who are bereaved and soothe those who are anxious, alone or fearful. In, In your mercy, hear our prayer. Accompany us on our journey, Pilgrim God. Sustain us through the sublime solace of nature, friendship, scripture and service of others. We give you thanks, God of all, for the apostles, saints, mystics and martyrs who lived and died with the name of Jesus written indelibly on their hearts. We give thanks for those we love and have lost, but who have entered the cloud, the mystery of your nearer presence, life beyond this life. These prayers we offer in the name of Jesus. Gathering all our prayers and praises into one, let us pray with confidence as our Saviour has taught us. Our, our Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We follow our prayers with one of the best known of all English Christmas carols, while shepherds watched their flocks by night. Written by Nahum Tate, Irish hymn writer and poet, eventually made Poet Laureate in 1692. However, his work generally lacked originality, and it is for while shepherds watched that he is chiefly remembered today. The work was the first and only Christmas carol authorised for use in the Church of England throughout most of the 18th century, thus helping to make it widely known. Most of the other carols were thought to be too secular and just not serious enough to be sung during church services. The carol, based on the Gospels, concentrates on the humble shepherds, making them the centre of the Christmas story. Glad tidings of great joy I bring to you and all mankind, says the angel, by implication extending the good news to everyone listening. No Christmas can be complete without singing this classic carol. The words are on the screen to allow you to join in if you would like to. Shepherds watched their flocks by night, all seated on the ground. The angel of the Lord came down, and glory shone around. Fear not, said the almighty dread, had seized the troubled mind. Glad tidings of great joy I bring to you and all mankind. A Saviour who is Christ the Lord and this shall be the sign. The heavenly babe you there shall find to human you displayed. All meanly wrapped in swaddling bands and in a manger laid. Thus spake the seraph 
and forthwith a bitter shining throng of angels praising God on high who thus address their song. All glory be to God on high and to the earth be peace. Good will henceforth from hell to men begin and never cease. May God the Father, judge all merciful, make us worthy of a place in his kingdom. Amen. Amen. May God, the Son, coming among us in power, reveal in our midst the promise of his glory. Amen. Amen. May God, the Holy Spirit, make us steadfast in faith, joyful in hope, and constant in love. Amen. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be with you and with those whom you love, now and always. Amen. Amen.